good morning and welcome to Colorado. Um, I just live up the road a couple hours. Um, so, so the premise that I wanted to discuss today is do open source software projects and nonprofits do it better? Um, I'm obviously a little biased. I think we do, um, but we can discuss it. And I want this presentation to be a discussion, so feel free to chime in now if you want to during it. Or if you see something and you have an idea, or if I missed a point, um, grab me any time today and, and, and let's talk. Um, it's a constantly evolving discussion. So first off, I want to see a show of hands. How many people here work for a nonprofit? Yay. <laughs> How many people here work on, a non, on an open source software project? So contribute in some form. Wow. All of you do both. Well, not all of you, but most of you. And how many people here have heard that nonprofits are inefficient? Or someone's kind of made fun and say that the corporate world does it better, um, and nonprofits are, you know, th they're slow. And how many people here have been told that they're crazy for contributing their time um, to something for free, especially software for some reason? If you contribute to, like, you know, the food bank, you're fine. But if you contribute a piece of software that you could have sold, then you're crazy. How many people have heard that? So I think they're crazy. Um, because we're obviously doing really well. Um, there are you know, mil thousands, probably millions of people in the world that work, billions of people obviously, that work on nonprofits, that contribute to open source software, and we're super efficient. I mean, I look at Mozilla, we have a thousand employees and thousands of volunteers. Um, so for the, the budget that we have, we're making a tremendous impact on the world. And I think the difference is the passion. So nonprofits and open source software have to be pa they have to have that passion. They have to inspire it. They have to keep it. They have to cultivate it. They just wouldn't work. I mean, y you have to believe in what you're doing to come do it for free or, or to contribute. And um, corporate, some corporations have that passion, and some don't. But they don't have to have it. So I think what we can share with them is how we inspire that passion, how we find it, how we get groups of people together, and how we keep them inspired. So pat yourselves on the back. Um, you're making a difference in the world. Um, whatever nonprofit you're working on, whatever open source software project you're working on, how many were Civi CRM when I asked about that? And yeah. it's, it's making a difference in the world. And it's not just making a difference in your mission, the thing that you're trying to accomplish. It's making a difference in the lives of all of those people that work with you. So we're, we're all here to talk about it. Um, I, I just wanted to point out the Civi CRM numbers. Oh, I think I grabbed this from a blog post from a little while ago, and I think you're already over 10,000 installations. Um, so this software is helping 10,000 organizations uh, manage their volunteers and manage their projects. And that's, that's a huge impact on the world. Um, that's 10,000 different organizations that, that are, are being impacted by it. Um, so we're making huge impacts with small numbers of people. And then what I think is really unique about Civi CRM that um, you could also share with the world is that you're bringing together here users and developers. There aren't a whole lot of other um, especially open source software projects where you get the users of the software and the developers of the software together. Usually they're kind of separate. Um, the developers meet, talk about how to make it, and the users use it, um, and they don't always cross paths. So I was curious, how many people here have been to, um, this is your second um, CiviCon? Awesome. And how many people here have been to, to three or more? Three, four, five? I don't actually know how many there were. Six? <laughs> <laughs> Seven? <laughs> All right. And the rest of you are newer. And I just wanted to point that out as the opening keynote, um, especially as I come here and I'm pretty, you know, I think I helped install Civi CRM at GNOME back in 2007 or 2008. So that was, but I don't know most of you. So I'm, I'm new to this audience. And when people show up and they're new, they think they're different than everybody else. Um, and it may be that everybody sitting next to you also thinks they're unique and also thinks they don't know everybody. So at the beginning of an event, I just wanted, oh, this is my different slide. Um, I, I once went to an event, um, this was a while ago, and I got there and I was talking to this open source contributor who I thought, you know, I'd heard of him, he's on all the mailing lists, he contributed huge parts of, of GTK, and I'm looking up at him, right, like he's at least a foot taller than me, and he tells me that I'm scary. He said it was really hard for him to come up and talk to me um, because I was so scary, and I, I don't feel very scary. <laughs> um, but, but for him, like, I was active. I had a blog. I was active on the mailing list. I was in lots of conversations. And so he knew who I was, and he didn't assume that I knew who he was, and he was afraid to approach me. Um, so I wanted to point that out. Um, so if, if everyone, who, who's at their first 
Who's at their first uh, CiviCon today? All right, s stand up for a second. All right, if, if, you, if you're sitting down, I have a homework assignment for you. Look at somebody who's standing up and go find them later in a break or at lunch and introduce yourself. Because um, they might be scared to introduce themselves to you. All right, you can sit down. Sorry to embarrass you. And, and just to make you a little bit uncomfortable, um, yeah, as if that didn't do it. <laughs> Um, I, I usually wear a t-shirt and jeans, you know, barefoot shoes. Um, but I heard the first thing that people rec notice when they look at you is your hair. Um, so that, that's why I brushed my hair in the bathroom before I came out here. <laughs> you, have, you have three seconds to make an impression on someone, and it's your hair and then your shoes. And all I can think is they must not have interviewed open source software developers. Like, <laughs> I really don't think that's it. And, and the reason that that I think we should go out of our way to welcome new people and to make sure we say hi to people that might be being quiet or don't say something is because I think the power of our communities comes from its diversity. And I think nonprofits and open source software actually manage to get more diverse communities. I don't know if it's because we're more global and you can participate from anywhere on the internet. I don't know if it's because the causes we champion bring people together. Um, we don't always have more diversity like when it comes to women in tech, but I think as a community, we have a lot of diversity. We have a lot of countries involved. How many people here flew from somewhere other than the U.S. to get here? We have diversity, um, uh, international diversity, we have age diversity, so there's a lot of different people and it makes our community and the problems, it makes our community stronger, it makes our solutions stronger, and it makes the problems easier to solve. Um, so I was going to, so back to the question of, of do nonprofits and open source software do it better? Um, I wanted to talk briefly about three things, and you may have um, points to contribute. I want to talk about why people volunteer, and then how we keep them, in, um, why they volunteer, how we keep them engaged, and then kind of some of the things that could go wrong with that. So why do people volunteer for nonprofits and open source software? So, so take a moment and, and remember the first time that, the first thing that you did for the nonprofit or open source software project that you work on? Like, who introduced you? How did you get there? Like, did you find it on the internet and say, I could contribute? Did your friend tell you about it? Um, and, and then what kept you there? So the corporate world says that people do things for money. And people do do things for money. And I have a whole other series of blog posts and a talk that I give about worrying about if money was going to kill open source software. Um, I don't think it does. I think it changes things. I think it changes people's motivations and ends up changing what they work on. Um, but I don't think it will kill any of the good motivations. And I wanted to point out, because after my talk um, about whether or not money would kill motivation, people thought all external motivations were bad. And I think sometimes external motivations bring us volunteers that are good. Um, so for example, um, I, I run a nonprofit, I used to run, I, start, I founded a nonprofit called Kids and Computers. And one of my friends was getting her, her master's degree actually from BU, and she actually teaches here now. And she said, my, my class, my MBA class, has to do a project, um, and we want to help you. And I was like, oh, that's awesome. And so they came, and they really helped us. Well, at first, so we were, had like 20 volunteers and like no budget, and they came in and they said, your finances are a mess. You don't have a plan. <laughs> and I was like, we don't have any money. We don't need a financial plan. Um, <laughs> So, so they kind of went back and they huddled, well, how can we help them if they don't have any money and we can't like, help them with their budget? And, and they did really awesome things. They helped us get our logo. Um, they actually set up a lab in Argentina. Um, so they helped, us with a they helped us with our websites. So they helped us with a bunch of the kind of, of stuff. And then when they were done, they all left. Not a single one of them stayed with the project. But they made an impact during that time. So I think saying that people that join for external reasons are bad is, is not necessarily true. You just have to understand why they're, why they're there, decide whether or not you want to try to keep them, and let it go. Um, the reason that people, the reason that's always given um, for why people contribute to open source software is this one. Does anyone know what the cow is doing? Yeah. She's scratching an itch. Um, so so uh, people, the traditional reason was that people thought people worked on open source software to solve a problem they had. Um, so one of the examples that always stuck with me was a guy who's, um, daughter couldn't talk, and so he used software that like read the software for his daughter. And he contributed to that project because it was super meaningful in his life. So how many people have contributed to a project because it was something you needed? Like you made it, you fixed a bug because you needed it done. 
Um, the other people, reason people contribute is to learn something new, to do something fun. Um, and they have actually done studies and they looked at if you offered someone a new job, learning something new, or you offered them a 20% raise at their current job, that's about the cutoff point. So more than a 20% raise, you'll probably stay at your current job. Less than a 20% raise, and you'll probably opt to go do something new, assuming you're making enough money to live well. Um, some people work on open source software to be able to put it on their resume. Um, I have to admit that I tried you know, to learn something they can put on their resume. I tried really hard to convince a bunch of women to different female friends of mine um, to get involved in open source software for this reason, and I, it, it failed for me. So it failed as a motivating factor. Um, some people get involved in open source software to mentor or be mentored, and, and nonprofits the same thing. This is Bijan. He's a, he's a Mozilla volunteer in, in India, and he came to one of our hack fests. He was really excited. Um, he didn't say very much. He's super quiet if you meet him. He hides behind his camera and takes lots of pictures. Um, and he didn't say very much, and he went away, and now it's a year later, and he's mentoring a, like a dozen different people. So he's brought in a whole bunch of other people to our project, and that's the role he likes to play. Um, some people just like to solve interesting problems. So there's a challenge out there, there's a, a piece of, you know, a, some problem that needs to be solved, they can solve it with a piece of software, they can solve it with a process, and, and they go for it. How many people were trying to solve the maze? <laughs> Um, some people do it to create um, cool things, so like the maker fairs are a really good example of this. Um, this is actually a Mozilla Festival in London, um, and it's really cool. One night, everyone comes in and they just set up all their booths um, and, and show the projects that they're working on, and you walk around with a beer and you get to, to play with them. And they even have, oh, you can't see it in my picture. There's, there's a, what are those balloons called? The, the balloons that fly overhead? The blimps, like blimps. There's a, there's a blimp in this picture. Um, and, and maker fairs, I, I really think what's cool about maker fairs is they're bringing what open source software did in the software space to the hardware space. And I, I can only imagine, so Mozilla is working on like a, an open source phone. I can only imagine when someone can print a, print a phone, or maybe it's not even a phone, you know, a device that does exactly what they want it to do um, in their school or in their home. And then sometimes people want to be um, part of the forefront. So this is, how many people have heard of SpaceX? So this is a project to send people on a one-way trip to Mars. Um, so it's supposed to launch, it's within the next decade, and they're gonna send four people at a time um, to Mars to colonate Mars, and there's no guarantee of a, a return trip. So they're all in training now, and, th and they kinda, like voting off the island, they'll vote four people at a time um, to go to Mars. How many people would go on a one-way trip to Mars? <laughs> <laughs> I think I could handle the one-way trip to Mars. It's like the six-month space, you know, the six-month trip to get there with three other people. Um, this is the OLPC. So, so this was the One Laptop Per Child project. It launched a while ago, and I happened to be at Scale, this um, big conference in Los Angeles, right after it launched, and I saw someone walking around with one. And I was like, oh, will you tell me about it? And this guy had no, no formal affiliation with the project. He just bought one. And he sat down with me and gave me a demo for probably half an hour. He was so excited about it. And you know, as I left, other people were sitting down. Um, so this guy was just passionate about the problem they were trying to solve, about the hardware they were creating, about the solution, um, that he was willing to share his time and energy just to tell other people about it. Um, another reason people join um, nonprofits, open source software projects, is, is for the community, for the people they meet. Um, often people say they didn't join for the community, but they stay for the community, they stay for the culture. Um, so this is actually my son with a bunch of friends that he met in a lab that we set up in Mexico. Um, we almost came home. One of these kids has a, a beetle as a pet, it's like a rhino beetle. It actually has a big horn that comes out and it's about this big. Um, one almost made it into our suitcase before I vetoed that. <laughs> um, this is the Mozilla Philippines community. And then one of the reasons that people thought could either be external or internal, and, and one of the things that's attributed to, to why people stay in open source software is fame. Um, and I disagree. I, I don't really think, I don't think any of the people that are in open source software that are famous thought they would become famous. I don't think that was ever in their mind. Um, but I think they do stay for the recognition from their peers. So they stay because 
they're with a group of people, they're in a community that they admire and they respect, and those people recognize what they have to offer and also admire them. So I think as much as we can in our communities, enabling people to meet each other and support each other and have those conversations where people um, can feel recognized by people that they respect is, is makes it stronger. And then um, this is a reason that I had to add after the, the first time I blogged about this. This is uh, people do it to do the right thing. So a lot of us, you know, you may come for the community, you may come for the interesting challenge, but one of the reasons you stay is because you're making a difference in the world, and that's important. So next I wanted to talk about growing community. So I, I said three things and I said them wrong in the beginning. Um, so it was why people volunteer, growing communities, and then how to keep those communities. Um, so when someone comes to your community, you don't usually teach them to fly by pushing them off the roof, um, not like birds. Um, so I wanted to talk about some of the ways that people help people get started. Um, so a lot of projects, GNOME is one of these, um, has, GNOME calls them GNOME love bugs. Um, and so they go through all the bugs, all the projects that they have, and they mark ones that are either easy for someone to solve, like someone who isn't part of the project. They can easily get a handle on it and accomplish something, or ones that people have agreed to mentor. Um, so they, they set the person up for success on that very first interaction with the project. And I would say a lot of projects, this is where they lose people. Um, people come, they try to contribute. Um, just, just building the, the thing takes a week to get set up. They don't have anyone near them. Um, and then they submit, they finally get it all done, they create their patch, they, or they do their pull request, and it gets ignored. Um, so I think it's, it's this um, first interaction that's important. The other thing that they've done studies on is it's really important to respond to that pull request or that email or that bug or that IRC request quickly. Like, I think the time frame is around 24 hours. And it doesn't have to be that you answer them. That, you know, if, if they submitted a pull request, it doesn't mean you have to review it and like merge it. But you have to say, I got it, and I'll get back to you. If, if people have that recognition within 24 hours, um, they're much more likely to stay around. If after 24 hours, they kind of figure you don't care, um, you're not responsive, and they go away. And that's true both for contributions to the project as well as donations. So if someone donates money to your organization, um, thanking them within the first 24 hours means it's much more likely that they'll give another donation later. Um, the other thing that's really important is mentors. Um, so creating, making sure that that person has someone that they have permission to bug, so someone they don't feel guilty about asking. Um, so it could be a group of people that mentor an IRC, it could be a, a personal mentor. Um, you might have different ways of assigning mentors. Maybe it's the first person that, that merged their pull request. Um, this is actually um, from, it's called Outreachy now. It used to be um, the GNOME, well, it's called Outreachy. And it's, it's a bunch of open source software projects that um, set up internships. And they used to do it in the summer, both the North, Northern Hemisphere summer and the Southern Hemisphere summer. And they set up the, it was, we originally set it up um, because we realized from Google Summer of Code that we were getting all white male US student type applicants. Um, so even if we had wanted to accept more diverse applicants, there, there, wasn't, the, there wasn't the pool to pull from. Um, so we created this program specifically for people that, in the beginning it was for women and now it's for a, a broader diverse group. I um, mean, it's been really successful. I think if you look at, I haven't done a formal study, but if you look at like the, the women in GNOME, um, a lot of them came through this program. Um, so this is actually my son and my parents in his class. Um, the thing I wanted to say about mentors is that sometimes um, I think peer groups are more important than mentors. So I think if you can set up cohorts of people that come in at the same time, like maybe all of you that are here for the first time that want to contribute to Civi CRM, um, you all get on a, like a private mailing list or you all introduce yourselves. And having that cohort of people um, that you can say, wow, do you know how to do this? Or like, who should I ask about this? Or remember that time? That cohort is really strong. And I think our, our school systems recognize that. Our school systems create cohorts of kids that graduate at the same time, um, grades of people that, that know each other. And some organizations do this, um, but especially like in large corporations when you go through your orientation, like I got the name of everyone in my orientation at HP, um, and we became this group of friends that I, I still know many of them. So I think cohorts are really strong. This is actually a lab in Mexico, and I was so impressed by these teachers. 
um, they had never used a mouse, they had never used a computer, and they sat there in front of their colleagues and tried. And like, I, I, I would have found it profoundly embarrassing. Like they, they seriously did not know how to use the mouse, but they all just laughed and giggled and helped each other and helped figure it out. Um, and, and so the, to, to reiterate my earlier point, I think people stay for the communities. They stay because it's fun, they stay for the people. I think people also um, come to projects for external rewards. So like I mentioned before, my, my friend had to do her MBA project, they came. Um, I think often in open source software projects, um, and maybe it's different in your organizations and your communities, I mean, I'd love to hear it. I think one of the, the external carrots that we often offer is travel. Um, so often there's travel sponsorships to go to events like this, or there's travel just to the events, or you know, the, the annual event is in you know, Copenhagen, and you get to go to Copenhagen for a conference, even if you're on your own dime. I think that travel is, is a good motivator. We actually had a case in, in Mozilla where um, a community member was really excited about all the places she'd been, and so she blogged about it, and she got a lot of grief from all of her fellow community members. Um, the, the reason she was doing it was just for the travel, um, to, because everyone wants to sit on an airplane for 40 hours. <laughs> so the last I wanted to talk about how we keep people, and part of this I have the ways that we lose them, the way that we don't keep them. Um, so one of the things that I think is really important when you're trying to grow a community or keep people is to make sure that you set direction. Um, has anyone ever worked at a place where you weren't really sure why you were doing what you were doing? Like, you were told what you were supposed to do and you just don't really understand like, how it's going to solve the problem? I, I think it's really important in volunteer organizations to make it clear, even if you're wrong later, to make it clear why you think the current solution is going to work. And I think that's the reason that open source software projects that have benevolent dictators do so well. Because it's the benevolent dictator is the one person who stands up and says, we're going to do it like this because of this. Um, and I think that's an important piece. I also think it's really important to have um, clear processes. I didn't mean to imply judgment with the picture. Um, but it's, it's important to have clear processes, especially for new people. Um, so like on kids and computers, I, I often don't I'm just kind of like, oh wow, sounds like a great idea, go ahead and do it. That's not enough permission for some people. It's not enough feeling that someone will back them up if they do well. Um, so they want to know, well, what am I supposed to say when I approach that person about this partnership? And what would the partnership look like? And if I bring them back, how do I get approval for it? And if I need a budget, how do I ask for that? And um, so the process helps people feel like they belong and that they have permission to do so. And then I think another thing is growing leaders. Um, I think when you grow leaders, um, you keep those people. They, they feel like they have a role. They, they feel like, not like they're important, but like they're making a, a dip, probably important too, but like they're making a difference. And so I think it's important <coughs> to <coughs> notice who wants to do a little more and, and give them a little recognition for that. Um, this was part of the, the grow leaders and inspire them. Um, I think you have to recognize what people's passion are and make sure that you that you work on that. I think I have that in a future slide. Maybe I'll get to it again, but I think you have to, so we have someone, um, kids on computers used to take, we still do, take donated equipment um, and install Linux and open source software on it and take it down to schools. Um, I hated this, because I have a basement full of like really old hardware. And uh, it, was, it was my job to house the, house the hardware and then figure out how we were gonna get the stuff installed. And I recruited a friend to help me and he lived for it. He loved it. He's, he's, you know, he's a retired engineer. He thinks it's really fun to tinker with these things. He shows me how he figured out that the laptop doesn't work because the USB drive had something jammed in it, and he spent a couple hours figuring that out. Um, and as I try to transition this away from old hardware, because I think it's painful, um, we're going to lose him if I don't find something for him to do, because that's what he's passionate about. That why, that's why he's there. And then I think recognition helps keep people um, not necessarily like recognition where you make them stand on a stage and you give them a prize, but just you know, letting people know what they did, um, calling out you know, most code contributions. Um, for a while in Mozilla, we had a woman who did like a, she just did a profile on a Mozillian every day on a blog. Um, it's just kind of a fun way to bring the community together, to call out people, make sure they know people. So this says Ubuntu. This is in, in my town in the, in the local Habitat store. 
Um, it's a free operating system that we put on our computers that don't have a licensed copy of Windows. It is Windows based. It has office and internet capability. Now, I showed this slide once at a, at a Unix conference and I really couldn't go on with my talk. Like, <laughs> we, I, we, we had like a 10 minute conversation about how Linux was not Windows based and, and what that meant and what I should have done about the slide, about the sign. <laughs> Um, but th the point of the picture is, is it's, we have to make it okay for people to make mistakes because they're going to make mistakes. And, and so you have to somehow make it okay. Um, so like at Mozilla, we had a, we had a tradition if, if, um, if you made a mistake, you brought cookies to the next meeting. Um, you just have to have some way that it's okay. So I mean, I could go up to, this person's doing an awesome thing, right? And, the, and they're promoting free software. Um, so I thought the best way I could maybe solve it would be to go offer to print, print a professional looking sign for them um, and then I could fix it. <laughs> and then as I said before, people stay for the community. Um, I live in a town of 5,000 people. If, you're, if you have some free time this weekend, um, it's up the road. And we have two breweries in my town of 5,000 people um, because this is Colorado. <laughs> and it's, it's become a local hangout. So I, we didn't know, this is my son on the right, he's playing with another family on the left. Um, his parents and us ended up playing Cards Against Humanity where the kids couldn't hear. <laughs> and, uh, but you just meet people there and that's where people go to, to hang out and, and do things. And so I think people come to open source software projects, to nonprofits, as a place to make friends and, and hang out. So what could possibly go wrong as you're trying to grow your community? Um, in this case, it was, it was the drummers in the band, in the, in the parade. I think the main thing is like you cannot talk about it. Like I think, I think people assume if they're working really hard on something and they put it on a mailing list, then obviously anyone who could help them knows about it. I think, I think you need, if you're working on something and you need help, you need to give talks like this, you need to see if you can get an article on opensource.com, um, you need to post on other mailing lists. You need to call out your volunteers that are doing an awesome job. You need to call that out loudly and broadly. So I think the main thing is making sure that can go wrong is not talking about it. Um, and then not letting people in. This is actually a picture in South Africa and there's an amusement park on the other side. Um, so I think sometimes we put up barriers either intentionally or unintentionally that don't let people in. Um, maybe, maybe it's your build environment. Um, we had on, on uh, MDN, the Mozilla Developer Network, we had a build environment that would take a long time to get set up. And when we reduced that to like a, I don't remember what we reduced it to, you know, it was less, less than a day, we got a lot more volunteers. Um, so sometimes there's barriers there whether you know it or not. And then sometimes we don't help the new people. And often this is when we're in a crunch time, we're trying to get something done. Um, they weren't very explicit about asking for help. You know, they submitted a patch and it was kind of blah. Um, and, and we don't take the extra step to say, wow, thanks for submitting that. And if you did the following five things, it would be better. Um, or I would have accepted it. And I think often it's because it takes longer to write that email than it would be just to fix it yourself and do it. Um, but just think of all the potential. Maybe not that person, but maybe if you helped five people and say it took you an day, extra day of your time to help each of those five people and one of them sticks around and contributes to your project for two or three years, that was worth those five days of your time. So I don't think you can look at it on each person, like I'm gonna help this person and they're probably gonna go away. Yeah, odds are you're gonna help them and it's not gonna quite be the right project for them or they only had that one bug they wanted to fix. But I think if you help enough of them, <coughs> the time pays for itself. And that's what you look like when your kids are playing outside and you're not allowed out. <laughs> and, and so I think often the barrier there is the time. So you don't have time right then to you know, critique their, their patch or their pull request and say all the things that are wrong with it. You don't have time to write that email. You don't have time to answer that question for the 10th time. Um, so I think often it's, it's a time thing that prevents us from accepting <coughs> new people in our project or keeping them. And then sometimes I think we don't teach them to tie their own shoes. Um, I, and I had this conversation with, with the, the woman, Avni Khatri, that now runs Kids on Computers. And there's a lot of times she knows how to do something and it's just, it takes her more time to explain it to me or another person than it does for her to do it herself. Um, like someone brought down our website 
and she just put the backup up and it was up and running. That was the right call at the time. If your website's down, get it back up and running. Um, but other times, something that she could do in five minutes would probably take us four hours to learn. Um, but by teaching us, then we can, we can do it later. And this is the slide. The topic here was supposed to be founder syndrome. And I know this looks nothing like founders. Like that would not invoke that thought in your mind. Um, but I searched for founders on Flickr, and this is what I found. She founded some yoga studio or something. Um, it was a cool picture. Um, so founder syndrome. So I think sometimes we, we get caught up in how we've always done it. Um, and this is really hard for me on groups that I've started or that I've run. And sometimes you have to let somebody else try another way. And so it's back to that permission to fail. Like sometimes you have to let them, they t they're all excited and they tell you they're gonna do it differently. And you're just kind of like, I really don't want to do that. Um, so like at, at Kids and Computers, we, we did recycled hardware, then we got grants for new computers, we got a grant of tablets. When we got the grant of tablets, there were a lot of people that were like, these kids don't need to learn how to use tablets. They need computers with, with keyboards. Um, now we're experimenting with Raspberry Pi, and there's some people that are like, that's not a true computer. And other people are like, they're gonna learn how to make their own computers. Um, so I think sometimes, especially for those of us that are in the project from the beginning, it's hard to kind of let those experiments happen. Um, but it's important if you're gonna grow your community and keep them. And I'm sure you guys have examples of that. And then I think you have to let the, the culture evolve. Um, so, so like, th this is actually a group of people, oh, it's based, it's, it's in obviously in Africa, um, I wanna say it was Namibia. They're using the Firefox OS phone. So Mozilla, Mozilla now makes a phone that's completely web-based, runs all on JavaScript, HTML um, technologies, and we're selling it cheaply in developing countries because people in developing countries are coming online for the first time on their phone. Um, so Facebook's also making a phone, which is awesome and that they're selling cheap, um, but they're it comes up on Facebook. Like that's, that's their experience of the internet is this kind of walled garden of Facebook. Um, so we want to make sure that when these people come online for the first time, they experience the entire internet. Um, but, the, but the point of the, the slide is that you have to let those communities grow in their own direction. Um, so like it's, I'll give the kids a computers example again. As we transition from old hardware to grants for newer ones, um, our culture is going to evolve from one of like, you know, weekend long hack fest where you're trying to get Linux on a machine that should be thrown away. Um, to, to one where people have to apply for grants and spend most of their time teaching the kids how to set up computers with Raspberry Pi. So the culture is evolving, and you have to let that happen. And you have to have fun in the meantime. Let, let people create those friendships in their community. And then I wanted to point out that you get what you measure. Um, and I think especially in nonprofits and open source software, I think, I think we could learn from corporations here. Corporations have metrics. They're accountable to shareholders. They, they measure money, that's usually their bottom line. They measure money, they're very religious about it, how many sales we had, what our profit margin was. And I think you get what you measure. Um, look at people that collect, you know, if, if your kid suddenly has four stuffed moose animals and he tells you he has four, what do you buy him for Christmas? A couple more stuffed mooses, right? Because um, he was counting them and he likes them. So I think what you count is what you get. <coughs> so if you want to count volunteers, if you want to count organizations that SIPI CRM is installed at, if you want to, whatever you're gonna count is what you're gonna get. Um, so that's, that's what I had. Um, I think you grow community by, by understanding the motivations, what brought the people there. So why did they come in the first place? What are they passionate about? And then enabling that to happen, whether it's growing leaders, recognition. Um, so I'm curious, as I'm, I'm, I'm here today, if, if you, I'm curious to hear if you guys have other thoughts, if there's other reasons I didn't cover, if there's other things you had. Any, any <laughs>